Good morning, San Inez Valley Presbyterian Church. A gorgeous day and what a gorgeous crowd here, congregation, gathering in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand and we're going to start with Bless the Lord, O my soul, from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship His holy name. your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your songs again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before Sing it with me, evening come. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His soul evening. Sing like never before. Oh my soul. I worship your whole. Tippich, and I will be reading Psalm 103, verses 13 to 22. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. 
The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone. And in its place, it remember or it, and its place remembers it is no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him, and His righteousness with their children's children, who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you His angels, you mighty ones who do His bidding, who obey His word. Praise the Lord, all His heavenly hosts, you His servants will do His will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Thank you, Claire. Let's sing together, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises sing. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and Blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, listen to the loving call. Wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, oh, be Savior, say. Sanctify us forever, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Please be seated. 
Let us pray. Please bow our heads together. Lord and Father, we gather here by the power of your grace through Jesus Christ. And our hearts are full, God, of the wonderful words of life that you've given to us through the scriptures, through the word incarnate, Jesus Christ. And as we open our hearts and humble ourselves, Lord, it's time for our confession prayer. We are called, Lord, in the midst of others to lay out our concerns, our sins, and ask for your forgiveness, O oh Lord. So search us and know us, Holy Spirit. See if there is any unclean way in us as we detail to you, one by one, how we've fallen short in word, thought, and deed, Lord God, before you at this time. Let us pray. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand, for it was finished upon that cross. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken his soul to me. Though the sun had ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ has triumphed over you. It was finished upon that cross. Now the curse. Now the curse, it has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me. Full of pardon, he has offered. Great the No more guilt to carry. It was finished upon that cross. Amen. Death was once my great opponent. Had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free. Amen. Free from every man of darkness, free to live and free to love. Death is dead. to eternal glory to my Savior and my God I rejoice in Jesus victory it was finished upon that cross it was finished 
Invite the children to go with Miss Liz right now, if you would. Children, rise and go with Miss Liz. Oh, there they go. Good morning. Beautiful worship this morning. That was awesome. So good to be able to join into voices and hear God's word as Claire read it. So great for us. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. And just to, for us to be able to get together and just to worship the Lord together and hear from his word. We have been um, shouldering ourselves through what we call the Olivet Discourse. And the reason why it's called the Olivet Discourse is obviously because it was given on the Mount of Olives and Jesus is teaching his disciples um, he's like a day out before he gets crucified, and so he's bas making sure the disciples know what's really, really important. Usually the last things we say to people before we leave them or before we go is probably one of the most important things we need to do to remember. So these next few chapters that we are going to be studying are really crucial for us as well, and we've been going through the idea of Jesus warning us and warning his disciples that his coming again is close. We've seen that uh, the abomination that causes desolation that happened in A.D. 70 as um, Titus goes into the temple and destroys the temple, destroys Jerusalem. The, na the nation of Rome comes and basically just destroys that city. There was great suffering and great death. A million people were killed. Thousands were imprisoned and enslaved. And yet there's a warning for us as well. And the warning for us as well is what we're going to be talking about today. And we have been talking about how we have been looking at what the end times looks like and how we are in the end times even now. And the great tribulation began back then, but we are still in tribulation now. And tribulation will continue until the day of our Lord. That tribulation might, will increase in power and intensity. And the Lord Jesus wants us to be able to stand strong in the midst of that upcoming tribulation. Knowing that in him we have strength, knowing that in him we overcome, knowing that in him we have victory. So he wants us to realize that our eternity is set in him and that the love of Christ will see us through. We continue our time in Matthew chapter 24 beginning in verse 36 as we see that Jesus makes the exclamation about what it means to wait for his coming and how we have been um, warned not to, to make it a theological gymnastics in order to try and predict when he comes again. So if you would turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll begin in verse 36. If not, you'll see the words up on the screen. Let's read the word together. Hear the word of the Lord. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and another left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill, and one will be taken and another left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. 
But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put in charge all, those, all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he is not aware. He will cut him into pieces and assign him to the place of the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we read these words and as we open your word, Lord, that we pray that you would speak to our hearts and that your word would become alive in us, that it would challenge us, that it would motivate us to be watchful and faithful. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be together during this time so that we might know you more deeply and serve you more personally. In Jesus' name, amen. It was September 2011, or 2001. Uh, people were going about their normal day. They were walking down the streets of New York, buying their lattes, hailing cabs, getting their way to work, taking their children to school. It was a day just like every other day. But on that fateful September 11th, terrorists guided jets into the Twin Towers and into the Pentagon. No one was expecting it. It came like a thief in the night. The horrific disaster that that was, the attack on our nation was horrific. Just think how different it would have been if we knew those things were going to take place. Just think how different it would have been if we were able to protect the lives of those dear people that lost their souls in that attack and the families that were in and are still being infected by that horrific attack. Or think of AD 79, nine years after the destruction of the temple, Mount Vesuvius explodes, Pompeii is covered in ash, suspending in animation the life of that town. If those people would have known that the volcano was going to erupt, they might have made plans to escape. We think of things, of natural disasters like that, of earthquakes. We keep hearing warnings that the big one's coming. Are we ready for the big earthquake in California? Whether it will come or not, we're not sure. But there's always room to be ready. It is like that with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was like that in the days of Noah. You see, at the very beginning, he says, no one knows about that day or the hour, not even the angels nor the sun. Now, that might surprise some of us. The angels we can kind of understand because they were created beings. But what about Jesus? Why doesn't he know when his own return will be? Well, what Jesus was is God. He is God in the human flesh. It's what we call the hypostatic relationship between being 100% God and 100% being human. In Philippians chapter 2, and you can read that on your own, it talks about Jesus' incarnation, how he emptied himself and became a servant, became like a human being, became one of us, and served us to the point of death even death on a cross, being obedient to his Father. And so Jesus willfully submitted himself 
to the knowledge and the will of the Heavenly Father, knowing that that will was sovereign and that will was what needed to be done. You can remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion saying, Lord, if it is your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And so Jesus willfully put himself under the care, under the authority of his heavenly Father. And the reason why he didn't know when his coming was, was so that he would be able to identify with humanity to 100% of the time. You see, he wasn't relying upon his, his eternal knowledge to be able to minister to us, but he was relying on the Father to reveal to him. The Council of Chalcedon in, in AD 451 puts it like this. In the one person of Christ are perfectly united without confusion, separation, mixture or division, the v divine nature and a human nature. Moreover, these two natures retain their own particular attributes. The divine nature remains omniscient, for example, but the human nature is still subject to limitations, to knowledge, for being ignorant of the fact is not a sin. And so like in the days of Noah, is like the days to today. And what were the days of Noah like? Well, our passage says they were marrying and, and giving in marriage. They were eating and drinking. But it was more than that. The reason why God flooded the earth was because that people became wicked. And their wickedness was so much that God had regretted it in creating their uh, people. And he goes to Noah, who was a righteous one, and he says, I want you to build an ark. And Genesis 6:11 says this, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Now today, God looks at our world and says, the earth is corrupt and full of violence, is it not? God saw how corrupt the earth was, had become, and all the people of the earth were corrupted in their ways. And God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all these people. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And so God's judgment on that wicked, unbelieving, stiff-necked generation is similar to the unbelieving, stiff-necked generation that we talked about last week on how people will refuse to receive and to understand God's love and mercy and grace and receive his forgiveness. You see, that generation took life for granted. They were about their own business, doing their own thing. They were about doing what felt good. They were eating and drinking and being merry and neglecting to understand the conscience that God had given them about what was right and what was wrong. And they failed to realize the perilous situation that they were in. How so today? How many of us today do not realize the perilous situation that we are in? The perilous situation of a, of a nation and a world that turns from their creator the perilous situation of individuals and families that think that they can do it on their own without God in their life, without Christ being their Lord and their Savior. And so God goes to Noah and says, I want you to build an ark. You have to realize that it had never rained on the earth before the flood. And so you can imagine Noah building an ark and he's saying, well, what's an ark? What do I need an ark for? You can imagine the people coming to Noah and ridiculing him, saying, what are you building there, Noah? Well, I'm building an ark. Why are you building an ark in the middle of nowhere? There's, there's nothing for it to do. Well, God told me to. And it took Noah 120 years to build that ark. 120 years for that nation, that stiff-necked generation, those people to realize that there was salvation available, and yet they chose to neglect and reject. By contrast, notice what Noah does. He is faithful. He continues on. 120 years of building a project, he has no idea what it's really for, except that God told him to. 120 years he said he was going to destroy the earth and that this would be his protection. And Noah was faithful and obedient to the call that God had given him. You see, today you and I have a call, a call to be a witness 
for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the call to be a witness for the love and grace that God has for each individual on planet Earth, that they may know that they have eternal life in Jesus Christ in repentance and in faith, and that only in Christ do we have eternal life. You see, what took place in the years of Noah, in the days of Noah, is very similar to the time of A.D. 70. And they didn't know when, but destruction came upon them suddenly. And like the days of Noah, the day of Christ's coming will come to us suddenly. They will come to us like a thief in the night. Jesus reminds them that it will be instant and quick. He will judge the living and the dead. In the days of Noah, when the rains came and Noah and his family entered the ark, the door shut. There was no hope for the rest of them. Once the door is closed, the door is closed. Once Christ comes again, that door will be closed. We live once, we die once, and then comes judgment. Jesus is warning his disciples, and he's warning us today to be ready. God did not spare the ancient world. He brought it in the flood. He will not spare the wicked of this generation, of this world, when he comes again. But he will spare by his mercy and his grace those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. You see, Jesus is telling all these things to us not to scare us necessarily, but to put reality and soberness into our lifestyles. It's clear that on this final day when Jesus arrives, the opportunity after that is gone. People today will be working, just like in the days of Noah. They will be taking their kids to school. They will be buying their lattes. They will be hailing taxi cabs. They will be going to their offices. They will be going to school. They will be marrying and giving in marriage. They will be eating and drinking. And yet Jesus warns, do you know that I'm coming? And are you ready? Are you watchfully prepared? He says it's like a thief in the night. A thief comes unannounced. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to be at your house at 2 o'clock on a Sunday night, and I'm going to rob your house. A thief comes when that thief wants to come, when he thinks it's the best time to come. And like this, Jesus announces the fact and puts an exclamation mark when he says, no one knows when I'm going to come. So quit fooling around with trying to figure out when I'm going to come and just be ready because it could come at any time. That's the message he wants us to really sink into, that today is the day to be ready for when the Lord returns. We have to live within that tension. We have to live within the tension of knowing that Jesus could come today or he might delay. Either way, we obey. I didn't mean to do all that, but it just kind of came out. I don't think I could say it again either. But, but the idea, the point is to keep watch. Be faithful. We've talked about this the last three weeks. Keep watch, be alert, stand, stand firm and watch the signs. I remember in, most of you as parents who had teenage children will relate to this. When our sons were teenagers and they had their license and they're out driving at night, out with their friends after a game or something, and then we tell them to be home like at, you know, 8.30, no, I'm teasing. Tell them to be home at a certain time for their curfew, and when that curfew time comes, I can remember Cindy saying, I can't go to sleep until I see the headlights that come through the window when I know that my children are safe at home. And there's a sense of anxiety of knowing, and there's a sense of, of waiting and having that anxiety of knowing when your children are home safe that you can relax and fall asleep. It's that same kind of waiting for Christ. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of tension, knowing that he will sustain and, and guide us, but recognizing the fact that we are alert, sober-minded, and ready to receive him when he comes. 
And so who is the faithful one? The faithful one, it says, is he or she who is doing the work that God has called them to do when he shows up. The faithful one is one who stays strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The faithful one is the one who pursues harmony and holiness in God. The faithful one is the one who grows in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and grows in his grace. And how does that person grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Through the power of his Holy Spirit who indwells every believer, who guides us into all truth and reveals the scriptures to us as we engage our minds and our bodies and our souls and everything that we are into the word of God that he has given us. Always reminding us that it's Jesus that leads us to peace. It's Jesus that leads us to salvation. It's Jesus who is the ark who protects us from the destructiveness of, of judgment. The immediate application of this I take very personal because the scripture says when, who is the faithful one is the one who God finds so doing in feeding his family. And so, so for those of us that are placed in positions of teaching and preaching and guiding people in the word of God, this has to be a sobering reminder for us that we will have a higher judgment. But it doesn't leave you out of the picture either. Because God has gifted each one of us. God has given us his spirit. God has, has empowered each one of you to be a member of the body of Christ to do what God has called you to do, to be faithful and watchful. The question I have for each one of us is how faithfully watchful are we being? Is our intention every day saying, Lord, I'm going to live my life for you today as if you were going to come today? If you knew God was going to come, if you knew Christ was going to come this afternoon, how would your life change? What would you do different? That's the kind of thinking we need to have in order to be ready for Christ when he comes. Because we want to be found doing the things that he's called us to do. In contrast, the wicked servant says, no, nah, we can wait. We know that Jesus, he hasn't come for 2,000 years. He probably won't come for another 2,000 years. So let's just kind of hang out and do what we normally do. Let's just get on with our lives, make our millions of dollars, watch our kids grow up, just whatever we're going to do, and leave God out of the picture. You see, the characteristics of a, faith, of a wicked servant is one who is faithlessness. One has, is not faithful at all. They're not looking for the master to come. All they're doing is looking for their own pleasures and meeting their own needs. They have a lack of commitment. A wicked servant has a commitment that is only for themselves, they are the center of their own universe. They have a lack of commitment to pursuing God and his ways and his, cult and his life for us. They are careless and unprepared. They're careless in their walk with the Lord. They're careless in the way that they honor God. They honor God in a way that's flippant, that takes him for granted. They are unprepared uh, because they do not pursue God. And then that leads them to being cruel. They eat, drink with the drunkards. They beat up their fellow servants. And their lifestyle becomes one of antithesis of God's love, mercy, and grace. I look at our world today and I grieve. Yet my grief has to be one that leads to action and prayer and preparedness and faithfulness to the word of God. You see, there are people out there that do preach the word faithfully, that warn people of his coming, that there is judgment at hand. But there are also people out there that say, you don't have to worry about those kind of things. Jesus is just a self-help guru that you just need to kind of apply your life to and be like him and it'll make your life better. And that's all he is to you. He's just a good teacher. He's a great friend, but he's not Lord. 
The wicked servant took for granted the goodness of God, takes for granted the, the grace and the mercy that God has given us, the gift of eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to guide us into all things that are godly and righteous. And what's the outcome? The outcome is not good for the wicked. And Jesus gets very graphic in his description. We have to realize that this is Jesus talking. He says, on that day when the master comes and finds those that are wicked and faithless and they have a lack of commitment and are careless in their walk with the Lord and are cruel to, uh, cruel to others, and there is a judgment awaiting for them. Could that be you today? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Have you truly put your faith and trust in him to be the ark for your eternity? See, that's the most important question that you can answer because Jesus' stark contrast between who goes to be with him for eternity and who doesn't is like night and day. One goes into the eternal glory of being with Christ forever and ever in his heavenly and earthly kingdoms, worshiping and enjoying his goodness and his faithfulness forever and ever. And yet those who reject the master's servant who is faithless, he will cut him into pieces. I don't believe that that's a literal terminology that God's going to cut people into pieces. But what it is is a symbol of total rejection, of total abandonment, and their punishment. You see, God isn't messing around. He's not just playing with your life. God is deadly serious about what needs to happen in order to know him and, and come, to his, come to his kingdom because the consequences are severe. There will be a total separation, a total abandonment. There will be weeping. Weeping is a sign of people who are unconsolable. Have you ever encountered somebody who has had a loss of their life or someone that has had loss in their life and they were completely unconsolable? You tried everything to kind of encourage them, to build them up, and they were just uncon unconsolable. They just wept and wept and wept. That's what hell is like. It's a never-ending hopelessness. No comfort. Nothing will ever be able to ease that kind of torment of your mind and of your soul. There will be eternal weeping. Then he says there will be gnashing of teeth. The idea of gnashing of teeth is that it's a frenzied anger. Your frustration will be so great that all you will be able to do is gnash your teeth in anger. It's excruciating physical, emotional, spiritual suffering with no relief. Jesus is serious. I hope we take him serious. Because there is good news. There's the best news in all the world that Jesus tells you these things because he definitely does not want you to experience those things. It would be like telling your little girl or your little boy, go, go, you know, if you go run out in the freeway, nothing will happen to you. You'll just, you know, you'll get hit by a car, but that's no big deal. No big deal. For those of us that have the privilege of being able to, breathe, to give the gospel, we have the responsibility to declare to the people that hear what Jesus had to say. There is a judgment coming. There is salvation coming. But the worst thing you can do is put off till tomorrow what you should do today. There's a fable. There's these uh, three demons that are going to Satan and they've been in apprentice demons and they're getting their finals 
and they're going to be let loose on the earth to try and destroy human beings. And they come to Satan, and the first one says, oh, I will tell them there is no God, and that will destroy them. And Satan said, that will not deceive many, for most people know that there, are, there is a God. The second one said, well, I will tell them there is no hell. And Satan said, that will deceive no one. Men know, even now, there is hell for their sin. They know there are consequences. And the third one said, well, I'll tell men there is no hurry. Go, said Satan, and you will ruin them by the thousands. The most dangerous of all delusions is that there is plenty of time. You see, the gospel message has a message of urgency. You know, we always say, why do today what we can put off till tomorrow? The scriptures tell us very plainly that today is the day of salvation. Do not put off till tomorrow what you can do today. If God is calling you today, today is the day that you repent. Today is the day that you receive. Today is the day that you enjoy the very presence of God's Spirit who gives new life. And that's my prayer for you. Now this morning we are going to take part in the communion table and that's what that table is all about. It's all about Christ who came and paid the, cro- paid the price for you and for me on the cross so that your sins and my sins would be nailed to that cross so that we would have eternal life when we put our faith and trust in him. That's where Jesus is leading us to. He's leading us to the very foot of the cross so that we might come in repentance and faith and receive his, his mercy. You see, the way to, to, to live for the future is to live lives of watchful faithfulness in the present. The way to live for the future is to live lives of watchful faithfulness in the present. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to your table now that you have laid before us this morning, Lord, to remind us of your great love, to remind us of your great mercy, to remind us of the fact that your salvation gives us eternal life in the enjoyment of your presence for eternity and forever. Lord, it is my prayer this morning that each one in this room and each one that hears my voice knows that, knows your love, knows your grace, knows your forgiveness, and is experiencing the joy of the Lord. But this morning, Lord, I can only imagine that there are some that have not yet repented and come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And today, Lord, may that be the day. May today be the day they come. They receive you and trust you as their King and Savior. And so this morning, Lord, as we partake of this meal, again, remind us afresh, remind us anew of the great love that you have for us, that you laid down your life for us so that our sins would be taken care of that we have freedom for eternity in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for Ancient of Days. Though the nations reign, kingdoms rise, still one king reigning over all so I will not fear for this truth remains that my God the ancient of none about
Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you're, for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word to express that love, but to warn us of what is to come, to encourage us to prepare and to be ready. And as we take this meal, Lord, we've been fed by your spirit so that we can do that very thing. We bless you. We give you all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads again with our prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Please bow your heads. Lord, we thank you again so much for your presence here and your promised return. Lord, let us stay aware and awake As we seek you in this moment, Lord, we would ask healing for uh, Lloyd and Jeannie Gibbs at Adderdag. Lloyd is dizzy again, Lord. We pray that you would heal him and touch him, strengthen him, and for Jeannie too. As they are together, be with them, Lord. Give them a peace that passes understanding and give them healing. We thank you so much that they're part of this congregation and we miss them so much. Be with them, Lord, in Adderdag during this time. And we do pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord 
by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. We will not be passing plates this morning, but there are receptacles in the back as you leave um, to place those there. That would be great. We're just so thankful that the Lord has been so faithful uh, to us, and, and we're so thankful for you being faithful to the Lord in the giving of your tithes and your offerings. Amen. standing for our closing hymn, Our God Reigns.
you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you and his countenance upon you. May you be watchful and faithful until the Lord comes. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.